Good afternoon or good morning as the case may be. Uh, I am Richard Fulton, co-chair of the Religious Freedom Committee of the ABA Section of Civil Rights and Social Justice, or CRSJ as we affectionately call it. CRSJ is thrilled to be, to be sponsoring this program on how to be an anti-anti-Semite, responding to the growth of anti-Semitism in the 21st century. We are actively planning additional programming on a variety of issues, so please visit AmericanBar.org forward slash CRSJ for updates on these programs. During today's program, we encourage you to ask questions of our panelists through the Q&A, not the chat function. If you do not see the controls, please ensure that your screen is not idle. I will be monitoring the Q&A along with others uh, involved in the program, and we will do our best to address your questions, time permitting. We'll be sharing a recording of this program with everyone who has registered so that you can share it widely with your networks. Uh, we are pleased to be joined today by Aaron Kayak, who will be delivering the keynote address. He currently serves as the Deputy Special Envoy uh, to monitor and combat anti-Semitism at the U.S. Department of State, where he works to advance U.S. foreign policy to counter anti-Semitism throughout the world. Mr. Kayak is an experienced leader and interfaith coalition builder who has previously built senior roles, held senior roles, advising members of Congress, the Obama administration, and the Biden-Harris transition team. The Office of the Special Envoy represents a special recognition that the continued existence, even acceleration, of anti-Semitism, the world's oldest hatred, demands specific and directed action by the US government. That office has acted without fear or favor in calling out Jew hatred from whatever place in the political spectrum, wherever in the world, and under whichever guise it may appear. So, uh, however, not to have the special envoy, of course, and, and the deputy are very busy people, and Aaron has not quite joined us. So I'm going to turn it over at this point to Mark uh, to introduce the panel uh, that's going to follow uh, Special Envoy KX remarks, and we'll, he'll, we'll, we'll bring the screen back to me and hopefully to Aaron. Mark, please. Great. Um, thank you, Richard, and, and uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, just let me introduce the other people who you see on, on the um, screen. Um, and it's an extremely distinguished panel. We're, we're, we're quite happy and proud to have them. Um, Alexandra um, Herzog is the Deputy Director um, of, in the Jewish Life Department of the American Jewish Committee. And um, she is a PhD, a scholar whose who's, um, who's, uh, uh, expertise includes uh, intergroup, interfaith dialogue, um, uh, she writes about uh, diversity, inclusion. She uh, uh, is working for one of the organizations that works tirelessly in order to uh, prevent and remedy anti-Semitism and uh, will have a, a, a greater opportunity to work, um, work with uh, uh, Dr. Herzog um, uh, once we are done with the keynote and we come to our panel. Um, our second speaker is... Um, Tyler Gregory, um, he goes by Ty. Uh, Ty is um, uh, both the executive director of the San Francisco Jewish Community Relations Council, um, an organization which works hard in order to advocate for the Jewish community and on social um, justice issues at large uh, within the, uh, the, the Bay Area Jewish community and nationally. He is also um, executive director of A Wider Bridge, an LGBTQ organization advancing equality, um, uh, equality uh, for, L for the LGBTQ community, equality in Israel. And again, I think that his portfolio goes um, much broader, much broader than that. And it's, uh, it's really a pleasure to have Ty with us this morning. Um, we are also really pleased to have um, um, Elisa Lewin. She is the president of the, Louis, of the Louis Brandeis Center for Human Rights Under Law, a nonprofit organization to advance the civil and human rights of the Jewish people and promote justice for all. Um, the Brandeis Center works tirelessly with, it, with regard to this, and we will um, hear from Elisa both with regard to um, both with regard to um, 
litigation and traditional legal remedies when we have this um, presentation to the American Bar Association. Um, you know, one of the places that we will go today, I hope, is to talk about the legal rights and remedies, you know, in terms of uh, us lawyers using our toolkit uh, to be able to advance this issue of, of equality and um, as well as the broader issues involved in identifying what what anti-Semitism is, how to combat it, the particular challenges being faced right now um, when we identify issues of anti-Semitism. Um, finally, finally, uh, it's our pleasure to have uh, Nadine Strassen with us. She is the John Marshall Harlan II um, uh, professor of Law and Education at New York Law School, past president of the American Civil Liberties Union, um, a senior fellow at FIRE, the Foundation for Individual Rights and Education, uh, a leading expert and specialist on, on this field, um, who is um, exceptionally well-grounded um, in terms of issues not only um, dealing with anti-Semitism, but, but free speech and essentially um, what it takes to be a, a free democracy, what kinds of values and, and skills uh, we have to be able to, to utilize in order to protect individual rights um, in a diverse society such as ours. Um, Mark, I know, Mark, I, Mark, I see that uh, our, our keynote speaker, we have, surmounted was, technical, I, we have surmounted the technical glitch that prevented us from seeing him. So... Um, me too. Me, me too. And so, uh, I mm -hmm. just with that, with that nod to Nadine, who uh, is going to fill out our our panel following the keynote. I am. Uh, I'm really anxious to hear who our keynote speaker is, Richard. Okay. So, Aaron, you have been the uh, pretty special envoy, Kayak. You have been introduced in absentia. Uh, someday, I'll share all the glorious things I said about you. Uh, but right now, please do go ahead and mark. Everybody's been introduced except for you, which I will do at the conclusion of the portion of the program featuring uh, Aaron before we turn over to, turn it over to the panel. So, uh, Deputy Special Envoy, please please go ahead. Slakti, mm -hmm. uh, very sorry about that. You know, there's not uh, much going on in the world at the moment or in this building. Uh, so, again, my apologies. So thank you, Richard, and thank you to the American Bar Association. Uh, for giving uh, me a moment to share a few words and for hosting me at this uh, crucial, crucial time. Uh, nice to see you, Eliza. Uh, especially during such times, it's always heartwarming to see so many friends from over the years engage in such important work. Uh, I'm honored to speak with you all and happy to take some Q&A after. As we all know, the terrorist attacks on October 7th opened the floodgates of anti-Semitism. In parts of Europe and elsewhere, there were more anti-Semitic incidences following 10-7 uh, Hamas attacks in Israel then in all of 2022. Worldwide, we are witnessing a surge in anti-Semitic harassment and attacks on Jews that we haven't seen in decades. We read story after story about vandalism of Jewish sites and Jewish communities debating whether to take down their mezuzahs or put them on the inside of their dera or cover the kippahs when in public. We also see people in the street marching against this latest spike in anti-Semitism and standing with the Jewish people, uh, just like we saw with some 300,000 folks uh, on the mall recently. We hear government officials calling out anti-Semitism and people condemning the Jew hatred that is on the rise, surging in social media. But there's still a lot of work to do, as we all know. Anti-Semitism comes in many forms, and lately we often see it manifest through some forms of criticism of Israel. Obviously, while criticism of Israeli government's policies or actions are not inherently anti-Semitic, some statements and activities can cross over the line into anti-Semitism. For example, just to name one, holding Jews around the world responsible for the words and actions of the Israeli or frankly any other government is anti-Semitic. Targeting Jewish communities with hate, intimidation, or violence is not defending the rights of Palestinians or human rights more broadly. It's anti-Semitism pure and simple. As Secretary Blinken and others have noted, anti-Semitism is also the canary in the coal mine. It is often a harbinger, uh, a harbinger of uh, hate and violence towards other groups and a threat to democratic values, national stability, and world uh, stability. Understanding how anti-Semitism manifests itself is crucial in fighting the cycle of hate. 
That's why so many countries are embracing the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance, or IRA, Working Definition of Anti-Semitism. The IRA Working Definition and its examples help all levels of government, law enforcement, international organizations, media, public figures, civil society, interfaith groups, sports teams, and educators identify and call out anti-Semitic hatred and discrimination, report and investigate hate crimes, and promote tolerance. It's also cr critical that all governments take steps to ensure the safety and security of their Jewish population during this time of heightened tensions. We've seen many countries increase resources to safeguard Jewish communities, and we continue to urge all governments to take the security of Jewish communities seriously and to use all resources at their disposal to ensure the safety and security of these communities, including appropriate investigation, prosecution, and punishment for those who commit anti-Semitic hate crimes. Combating anti-Semitism requires a whole of government approach and a whole of society approach. More than ever, we must look at our roles and understand how we can use our positions to fight this pernicious hatred. I am thankful that you are taking the time to engage with me now uh, to do just this. And I'd like to understand how you two can be, how we can together can be part of the greater solution. As we commemorate uh, International Holocaust Remembrance Day next week in honor of the memory of the 6 million Jewish victims, we must redouble our efforts to combat anti-Semitism and other forms of hate. The lessons of the Holocaust teach us that hatred, if left unchecked, leads to ever-widening horrors, spreading destruction on entire communities and threatening national and international security. Together, we can ensure that the voices of the past are never silenced and that all people are able to lead a life in dignity and safety unmarred by hate. We're, of course, seriously concerned by the robust uptick in anti-Semitism globally. Uh, just before I conclude my remarks, let me please touch on a particularly deeply troubling development over the last few months. I have particular concern that since the October 7th Hamas attacks, there has been an increase in the People Republics of China's state media and online discourse of anti-Semitic tropes that Jews control the United States through deep U.S.-Israel ties, as well as control over banks, the media, and that they have influence over government leaders. For example, uh, in an October 2023 program on, quote, uncovering the Israel elements of U.S. elections in history, PRC state media, uh, China Central Television alleged that Jews who represent 3% of the U.S. population control 70% of its wealth. Conjecture that Jews control the U.S. government and U.S. wealth is an anti-Semitic falsehood intended to degrade trust in the United States, our democratic institutions, and ultimately democracy around the globe. We emphasize there is no place for hatred of Jews, Muslims, Christians, Arabs, Palestinians, Israelis, or any group. Neither anti-Semitism nor other forms of hate promote peace or rights of any particular group. We will continue our efforts to engage with governments and civil society in the Middle East, North Africa, and other Muslim-majority countries to address anti-Semitism, build interfaith understanding, and de-link the conflict in the Middle East from other efforts to increase understanding and acceptance between uh, Muslims, Christians, and Jews. Uh, uh, thank you, Rachel. I'll end, leave some time for some questions. It's really the favorite part. You've heard enough from me, and I uh, really appreciate the platform. Well, thank, thanks so much, Aaron. Uh, I'm, as, I, as I look at some questions that have come in, I see they're really directed to the panel, but I do have a, a question for you. Uh, and the, some of the panelists may have questions they, they want to ask you as well. Uh, so my question, my question is this. I realize that the writ of, the, uh, of, the, of your office it only really begins at the shore and moving outward. That is to say, you're not charged with dealing with domestic anti-Semitism. Nevertheless, I, I believe you were involved in the, uh, your office was involved in the preparation of the very important strategic plan to combat anti-Semitism that was developed by the White House. I wonder if you could give us some insights into uh, your office's invo involvement in that, in developing that, but also, you know, I implementing it. Uh, what, what, what role you all, you all are playing in seeing that that plan gets implemented and gets the kind of backing uh, across the breadth of the government that it really that it really needs. No, of course, uh, Richard, you're 100% you're correct. Uh, our congressional mandate uh, that created this office in 2004 is international. That's why we sit in the State Department. Um, but more and more, the line between domestic and international is increasingly blurred. Just for example, when it comes to social media, um, you know, 
the internet does generally not respect um, uh, geographic boundaries and certainly the haters, <laughs> they certainly don't respect them. Uh, yeah, our office was honored to be part of this historic uh, national plan to combat anti-Semitism. Um, our office does deal with foreign policy, but you know when you have Deborah Lipset in your administration, you take advantage of her expertise. Um, so between her and uh, the leadership of Ambassador Susan Rice at the time, and second gentleman Doug Emhoff, um, and Liz Sherwood Randall, and uh, Jewish liaison Shelley Greenspan, and many others. I'm going to get in trouble for all the names I didn't mention. Uh, but first, I want to say, uh, now I'm sure for this August group, everyone has read every single page of the plan. Um, when, I, when I'm engaging with folks uh, really around the world, I think it's important, especially for people like you all who understand the intricacies uh, of the fight, to actually read each page. It is quite an impressive plan, comprehensive. Uh, you know, it, it, there are individual actions. There's over 100 deliverable actions um, for, um, you know, over two dozen agencies. One of the things that I that impressed me the most was in the creation of this plan, we had something called uh, an IPC, uh, which is sort of an interagency process. So I would be on the line. Of course, we're experts on anti-Semitism, but there would be someone from DHS, agriculture, DOJ, you know, even, you know, the Smithsonian's, um, where they were tasked by the president of the United States that they have to deal with not just combating anti-Semitism, which of course uh, is important, you know, keeping the local Jewish community safe, uh, but also celebrating Jewish life. It's not just enough to uh, combat the haters. We have to, you know, we have an obligation, uh, you know, sitting in uh, an agency that um, had a really an evil record uh, during World War II. You know, we all have the um, obligation to uh, take care of the bad in the world, you know, the anti-Semites, but also to make uh, the United States in this case but also um, countries throughout the world, especially in Europe, more welcoming uh, for, for Jews and Jewish practice. Uh, so one of the things that has impressed me the most is when I deal with our colleagues at the NSC or at Agriculture or at Department of Education uh, or at, again, even the Smithsonian's, uh, is the developing understanding of anti-Semitism that they have. Uh, there were numerous times when I was part of this interagency process or when Ambassador Lipstadt was part of this interagency process, and we hear something that we're all familiar with, right? And it's and it, it, it's it's totally an understandable thing to think uh, that anti-Semitism is just um, a, a religious hatred or a religious bigotry. And it's something. Look, it takes a sophisticated understanding of anti-Semitism to understand all the dynamics of it. But I, but I remember at one point, a couple months in, uh, one of my colleagues uh, in one of the other agencies was talking about the religious act aspect of anti-Semitism. And then uh, right before she had the opportunity to say and 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 get to the other couple senses, I unmuted. I was ready to engage and you know have an educational moment. But I think what's so what I found so what, what I wasn't necessarily fully expecting um, is of course I knew the agencies would have to do as they were directed by the president. Uh, I, I just didn't fully appreciate how engaged and how nuanced they they became when dealing with uh, both within their agencies and, and the services they provide. I'll just provide one more example, and then I'd love to get some more questions. Um, for example, FEMA, right? You know, there's nothing anti-Semitic about FEMA, um, but it's something that, that that they hadn't thought about when engaging, for example, kosher keeping communities. So if they're responding to a natural disaster um, in Muncie, for example, they have to ensure that the food they're providing includes kosher options. And that's just not a box that they had to check, um, you know, when they're going through their supplies, and now they do. Um, you know, it's about when you have cultural activities celebrating, um, you know, communities from around the world, or a holiday in a particular season, uh, or a particular uh, heritage month, that you, of course, include uh, the Jewish community in that. And a, a lot of times, Maybe there was some unconscious bias, but it just wasn't on their agenda, and now it is. Great. Thank, thank you. I, we have now gotten some questions, uh, and we're certainly not going to get to all of them in the brief time we have, but uh, that, that I think are within uh, your 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 wheelhouse. The first, not not too surprising, since this is largely an audience of lawyers, is uh, there's a lot of interest in the proceedings at International Court of Justice and the position that the United States has taken, uh, and. It'd be great if you could talk a little bit about how, you know what 
how the U.S. understands what is happening there uh, and what uh, what has been done and is likely to be done as that case moves moves forward by the United States. Yeah, well, I'd be embarrassed to go on at length in front of an audience of lawyers. Uh, despite my, to my mother's great disappointment, I never did go to law school or medical school for that matter. Um, but, you know, I think I think the secretary and our government's been quite clear uh, that the uh, there's no basis that the argument is meritless. Um, you know, it's it's it, it's a, it's an absurd idea that a modern government like Israel would be committing a genocide um, with all of the um, actions that they take to minimize civilian casualties. And I think we'll see the, that play out at the court. But again, I'm already out of my depth, so I don't want to. Okay. <laughs> I don't want to prove my ignorance. I'd rather you just assume it. Uh, okay. I'm sure you know more than you're admitting, but but th- but let's move on. Uh, and I think this one will be more in your wheelhouse. Uh, and that's the the issue of the era definition, uh, oh. which in in the in the national plan on anti-Semitism that was clearly indicated as the preferred definition of anti-Semitism, and of course it's in a State Department uh, document. Uh, could you uh, discuss the complexities that are presented by these dueling definitions as you advocate against anti-Semitism broad and and you know to what extent the U.S. sees it as, as important to keep pushing that forward as the preferred uh, definition? Yeah, I mean, as you all know, there's a lot of nuance within the IRA definition and its examples. Uh, there's no nuance in how we uh, use the IRA definition or what definitions our offices our office engages with uh, abroad. Uh, you know, it's the official policy of our office and the foreign policy of the Biden Harris administration that we urge other countries to embrace the IRA definition, inclusive of its examples. You know, very early on, I'm sure you all know, uh, the State Department uh, and Secretary Blinken himself um enthusiastically embrace the ira definition inclusive of its examples um to to speak of jda for example um both you can't have ira and jda uh coexisting um jda if you just look at the plain language um is is contra ira and says that ira uh harms the overall fight against anti-semitism so that's something that our office obviously rejects um and then when it comes to the nexus document it's clearly intended as a domestic definition. Uh, if, if you read, it talks about um, how you talk about uh, Middle East policy within the American political context. Uh, so that's something that our office just doesn't engage with, given our explicit international mandate. Uh, so time allowing, I'd like to, I'd just like to ask our, our distinguished panel whether there's anyone on the panel who has a, a question and we'll make this the last question because I know you're you have many other things to attend to uh if anyone on the panel has any questions that they want to ask uh and I, I think Mark has his hand up so so please proceed Mark Schickman who is the uh who will be moderating the panel thank you um thank you Richard um and and thank you so much uh for for being here ambassador um so, you know, it's said that anti-Semitism is the oldest hatred and been around and a long time, but something new is um, the use of cyberspace in order to um, spread anti-Semitic tropes, misinformation, um, conspiracy theories. Um, do you view that as a new element? And, and can one combat... Uh, misinformation that's going out by the millions by having community meetings where we educate people a hundred at a time. How 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 do you fight misinformation and hate on that level? Yeah, I mean, especially pre-October 7th, uh, that was really um, one of our major challenges. Um, you know, like you said, Mark, anti-Semitism is uh, known as the world's oldest hatred. It's ubiquitous. Um, so why, the, especially speaking previous to October 7th, why the uptick uh, over the last uh, number of years? And I think what you see with sort of every new technological development throughout history, uh, whether it was the printing press, which helped spread the anti-Semitic lie of blood libel, uh, whether it was, um, you know, just, just to stay on that for a little bit longer, um, you know, it used to be that if you had an anti-Semitic preacher 
you know, maybe they would preach to their church or their local community, but their reach was inherently limited. Um, so once you have the printing press, uh, you can exponentially um, reach more people. Uh, we saw that with the advent of the radio, um, you know, with Father Coughlin. And what, what you're not only reaching more people, uh, which is obviously damaging uh, when you're spreading hate like he did. Um, but the, but in a weird sense, it's hard for us to understand nowadays, but like in a weird sense, the new talk technology brought a certain credibility. So people listened to, uh, sat next to their radio, uh, and sat next to the radios, and there was certain authority to the voice that came over the radio that maybe if you heard them yelling in front of your local bar, uh, you wouldn't give them that credibility. Uh, we even saw it, when email became more widespread, um, I see it. Yeah, I don't want to get political, but just descriptively, I saw it um, around uh, 2008 and 2009 with some of the conspiracy theories and lies around uh, Obama, where uh, there would be these email chains that would get forwarded and forwarded and forwarded uh, by some of our grandparents. And the question would be, what if I understand it's probably not fully true, but what if just 10 percent of it was true? And And this is I'm not talking about. A, a, a blog that's not credible that has some citations i'm talking about someone just typed on their computer these accusations without citations or anything um but because it came across over email for some reason it was worthy of saying what if just 10 percent of it is true and so what i said to them at the time is you know you those brown paper bags you take uh, for your lunch i said if i scribble this out on a brown paper bag with a, a sharpie would you say well aaron what if just 10 percent of this is true um and then of course we see that with social media um, where people, even well-educated, uh, seemingly well-informed, uh, certainly influential people, will retweet baseless claims and certainly anti-Semitic rhetoric um, on, you know, and it will spread on the internet. Uh, so we we see that there are, are um, you know, influential figures, maybe in sports or in uh, or in Hollywood or elsewhere, where they're able to reach millions of people. With the press of a button you know it used to be like for example with holocaust denial uh materials uh you would have to you know you'd go to a p.o box and you'd get it mailed to you you know maybe you'd hang out with a few of your buddies in your living room and 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 you know talk about um your anti-semitic ideology but now ev almost everybody and certainly anyone with the internet connection has the ability to reach such a broad platform um that the hatred is, was always there uh, of course, as we all know, uh, but what we have now is a delivery mechanism that each each time if printing press, you know, radio, maybe email and certainly social media, it just has an exponential spread. Um, so it's not it's not that the anti-Semitism is sort of always there. Uh, and now there's just this low cost uh, delivery mechanism. Uh, often, you know, you don't even have to go by your real identity. Uh, when you're engaging in social media, uh, which makes it really, you know, troubling and 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 deadly, and and what we've seen since October seventh, um, uh, with the tsunami, with the tsunami of anti-Semitism, is we see it when dealing with what happened on October seventh. It took some time for Holocaust denial to really uh, take hold after the Holocaust. What we saw on October seventh and October eighth, and every single day since, is the real time denial of these atrocities. I mean, you you almost you know, some of these terrorists live streamed their atrocities. Some of them bragged about it. Some, you know, a lot of it's unfortunately quite well documented um, because of how horrendous they were and just, you know, going to the actual site of the atrocities. And there wasn't even time for for the truth to come out or, or for um, it, it was it was it was denial in real time. Um, and what we see, I'm sure many of you saw. Ambassador Deborah Lipstadt and Ambassador Michelle Taylor's op-ed in the, the Guardian the other day, <clears throat> where we talked about these atrocities and really the worst type of atrocities uh, committed against girls and women. And it was it was me to believe the women, except when it comes to Jews. And that's something, um, you know, we have to constantly uh, fight against and call out. Thank you. Uh, thank you. It's a so. Deputy Special Envoy Aaron Kayak, thanks so much for taking time out of your your very busy schedule to share your your wisdom and your insights. Uh, it was uh, I found especially interesting this last this last these last concluding remarks about 
the denial in real time, as you put it, of the atrocities and how that that is part of the, the very challenging uh, picture that you have to deal with on a day to day basis. So so I'm going to say thank you. You're welcome to stay on and 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 listen to as much as you like. I have a feeling, though, that you've got uh, mountains of other obligations waiting for you. And if you choose to, to depart, we all understand why that has to be the case. Well, uh, I appreciate the opportunity, Richard. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, as I said earlier, uh, Mark uh, Schickman will is is the moderator for the panel that is now going to follow, uh, and he introduced our panel already. But he himself has not been introduced. So, but my very last uh, act as the opener of this program uh, is to introduce him. Uh, Mark is a the delegate from the ABA section of Civil Rights and Social Justice to the ABA House of Delegates, uh, of having played many other important roles with CRSJ. Uh, he is the principal of Schickman Law, and it was Mark, I would just add, who during the, his term as chair of CRSJ, recognized the need for a committee of the section devoted specifically to the protection of the First Amendment's first liberty, religious freedom, rather than have that critical issue simply being folded into the work of other committees. In that, it reminds me, of the creation of the position of ambassador at large for international religious freedom, which is at the state, state department as is Aaron Kayak's uh, department, where they also, where the state department with some prodding uh, from Congress uh, came to recognize that religious freedom, the international religious freedom needed its own voice and its own special attention. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Mark who is going to uh, be uh, moderating and, and leading the rest of these proceedings. Mark, please take it away. Thank you, Richard. Um, so uh, just let me try to set this program up uh, with a couple of preliminaries. When um, when the attendees to this program received uh, the notice, and every notice of this program harkens back to a, a different program that Richard and I helped put together last year, which was a 21-day challenge on anti-Semitism that discusses this issue from numbers of facets, ranging from the issue of Jews of color to um, the religious uh, roots of anti-Semitism to manifestations today. Um, uh, we urge you to use that 21 day challenge as a resource. And a lot of the resources you're, you're gonna hear about today are included there. One of them um, is ABA resolution 514, uh, which, uh, we passed, uh, uh, which we passed a year ago, by the way, Ali, thank you so much for uh, putting into the, the chat a moment ago, the 21-day uh, practice link if people don't have it, as well as Resolution 514, which programmatically calls upon the um, ABA to take steps to oppose anti-Semitism. Hence, this program, whose topic is how to be an anti-Semite, -anti where we want to talk about the problem and then strategies in order to address the problem. Uh, let me kind of start by saying, and and there's a there's a pyramid chart I'd like to put up on the screen if I can, um, uh, which which um, demonstrates the fact. Uh, so next one, that pyramid, if we can, right? So it 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 identifies the fact that when you talk about anti-Semitism, you start on an attitudinal basis, and you sit there and say, what kinds of attitudes do people have as a result of a couple of thousand years of being inculcated into, into an often anti-Semitic culture, and when and how does that escalate into action? So in looking at the issue of anti-Semitism, one needs to look at both of those things, both attitudes and then action. When we talk about attitudes, Nally, I don't know if we can go to the uh, next slide, um, there is a global report. This global report is also in the 21-day um, uh, uh, challenge. This identifies on a worldwide basis numbers of people and populations who have a, um, who have a series of anti-Semitic um, beliefs. Um, Aaron mentioned one. I mean, we're less than 3% of the population, and people believe that we control 70% of the wealth. The notion that the Jews control the wealth in society, that Jews only look after other Jews, that Jews are are too clever to be trusted. These are series of tropes 
And what you see on the screen right now is the percentage of people worldwide, um, according to this study and the ADL updates it every year, who harbor a series of those tropes. Harboring one doesn't necessarily reflect anti-Semitic attitudes. But as you will see, in Western Europe, numbers 24%. Eastern Europe, 34%. The Americas have always been um, much lower than that, in large part due to our history of, of religious tolerance. As Richard mentioned, freedom of religion was our first freedom. And the United States is unique in turning its back upon that history of religious discrimination. And that has served us well. Ali, next slide, please. Um, and as a as a as a result, as a result of that, if you look at 2019, whereas that Nash was that international average was 26%, in 2019, that um spread of anti-Semitic attitudes was held by 11% of the population. A new survey was taken October of 2022, not 2023, 2022. I really wanna stress that at its heart, this panel and this, this topic rather is a pre-October 7th, um, a pre-October 7th uh, notion. And, you know, it's a little bit flip, but, but anti-Semitism has at its roots, it's got no more to do with the October 7th um, atrocities than it does uh, the Black Plague. And we were accused, Jews were accused of being behind both of those because of attitudes that were stirred up by different actions. So October 2022, 4,000 Americans were surveyed. People who do polling understand that this is four times the usual number uh, in terms of, uh, of, of samples that are selected. 85% of Americans believe at least one anti-Jewish trope. So, so you'll see that. That's up from 61% in 2019, which is troubling, but one. But whereas in, in 2019, 11% of Americans would agree with six or more of those tropes, today that's 20%. And if you look at the number of people who believe all 11 tropes, that's 3% of Americans, about 8 million people. By the way, more people believe those tropes than there are Jews in the United States. So um, what you see on that pyramid is, is you will see some people who have got deeply anti-Semitic attitudes, others who have got a softer group of anti-Semitic attitudes. And as a result of external forces, uh, that then turns into action. What has happened to action? Ali, the next slide, please. Um, this is a, a chart of anti-Semitic uh, incidents, a 10-year review from 2013 to 2022. And what you see in 13, 14, 15 is kind of that base level of anti-Semitism that we've seen in the United States uh, consistently for a very long time. Uh, we're not going to get rid of anti-Semitism in the United States. It's always going to be some. But as you see, that number um, doubles between 2015 and 2019. It's on the it it was on the verge of doubling again between 2019 and 2022. And uh, as everybody has been uh, referring to, uh, can use the word tsunami. You can use historical levels. You can use whatever else to indicate. Um, that anti-Semitism has become uh, even more of a problem because of the flashpoint of October 7th. So with that, uh, let me start with Dr. Herzog. And let me ask you, when you look at this, uh, what can you tell us about where this all comes from and what we can do to try to, um, to, try to combat it? Uh, thank you, Mark. Uh, thank you for sharing those slides and thank you for having me here. Um, so this is actually a really big question that we're starting with. Um, I'm going to maybe just give a little bit of an overview of what um, anti-Semitism has really looked uh, like in the last decade and maybe talk a bit about the reasons for those 
patterns and, and the reasons behind those spikes. So as it was mentioned before, anti-Semitism is known as the longest hatred because we can really trace it to the past two millennia. I'm going to spare you and I'm not going to go too, too far back in time, but I will say that anti-Semitism, as it's been mentioned, has really increased tremendously in the last 10 years. The reason really is that more people believe in conspiracy theories in general. And as we know, anti-Semitism is actually a conspiracy. It's the belief that an evil someone or an evil something in power is exploiting humanity, is almost hurting humanity. And the other reality is that people don't really know how anti-Semitism works because it's not linear. It ebbs and it flows as we've seen throughout Jewish history. Now, anti-Semitism is used to be used to be limited to fringe groups, but it's really now seeping into mainstream society and it's actually being fully normalized. And that's really what the problem is. And I will add that it often starts with the Jews, but um, it never stops with the Jews. So this is really a, a, a danger to everyone and not just to Jews. So if we look at, you know, just in general, the, the different events that have happened in the last couple of years, I'll say that, of course, there's always been rhetoric. It's It's been present. It's not something new. But anti-Semitism has really been on the rise. And it actually has been more violent. And it's been more open. So we know that we remember in 2017, the terrible white supremacist rally in Charlottesville, Virginia, where you had neo-Nazis chanting that Jews will not replace us before one rammed his car into a crowd of counter-protester killing one person and injuring 35. We also know about the Pittsburgh attack at the Tree of Life Synagogue in 2018, where a gunman with anti-Semitic history started shooting at congregants on a Saturday morning in the midst of services, killing 11 people and wounding six. We also have to remember in 2019, the Poway Synagogue shooting in Poway, California, where a gunman was charged into a synagogue during Passover services, killing one person and injuring three. Now, the shooting posted an anti-Semitic message on an online platform right before the shooting saying that Jews were conspiring to wipe out white Europeans, which of course is an anti-Semitic conspiracy. Um, and you know, there are many different events. We know in 2021, different assaults of Jews on different on, on the streets of many different cities in America, from New York to LA, etc., following the war between Israel and Hamas. Um, Colleyville in 2022, uh, where a gunman held four Jews hostage in a synagogue for 11 hours until the rabbi, in an amazing act of bravery, managed to facilitate their escape. So if we look at numbers, the hate crimes against Jews uh, increased by 37% in 2022, according to the latest data that were released by the FBI. The same data found that more than half of religiously motivated hate crimes were committed against the Jewish community, despite Jews only accounting for 2.4% of the American population. And of course, as Deputy Special Envoy to Monitor and Combat Antisemitism, Aaron Kayak has mentioned, we've seen an exponential spike in global antisemitism since October 7 that was directly related to the Hamas instigated war. Um, in the last few weeks, we've seen a global rise in antisemitism of over 1100%. In the city of London, we've seen actually an increase of 1300%. And in the United States, an almost 400% increase. And I'm not just talking about anti-Israel incidents. I'm talking really about destroying Jewish restaurants, you know, graffitiing Jewish homes, shouting, kill the Jews, um, torching synagogues really all over the world from Berlin to Tunisia on the dorm rooms of Jewish students. Um, there are so many examples, unfortunately, out there of Jewish cultural centers being vandalized, attempts to stab Jewish people while yelling free Palestine, putting stars of David on Jewish homes in Paris and in numerous other cities. Now, these numbers and incidents really reflect a very troubling trend that terror against Israel is linked with increased anti-Semitism against Jews 
around the world, both in person and online. So there are two things that we really need to understand. The first one is that the high visibility of Jews in some sectors of society is actually a very new phenomenon. There were quotas and restrictions on Jews in school and housing throughout through the 1960s. So Jews may be in comfortable positions or assimilated, but we know from history that it's not a guarantee for safety and it's not a guarantee to be free from bias and from discrimination. The second point that I want to make is that also anti-Semitism in the U.S. points to various sources. I've listed a couple of incidents that have happened in the last couple of years. But what we're really seeing is that it's coming from the far right. It's coming from Islamist extremists, uh, like we saw in Colleville. And it's also coming from far left when anti-Semitic statements by you know different celebrities are being put out. Um, and we see that a lot right now on this post October 7 landscape and with what's going on on many college campuses. So if we think about the spikes, we see different patterns. In general, with anti-Semitism, we see spikes around elections, around Jewish holidays, and around violence in the Middle East. And that's, of course, where we're at right now, post-October 7. There are also many reasons for it. The first one is ignorance about what anti-Semitism is, what it looks like, but there's also rising economic uncertainty, the lack of confidence in democracy, an increased emphasis on race and national identity with a polarization and an a siloing of not really taking into account the complexities of Jewish identity and also the reality of the diversity of the Jewish community and the Jews themselves. We are, you know, being basically put in this category of Jews as being completely white and the oppressors, which of course is in, entirely wrong and a fabricated type of binary system. Um, there's also, of course, the fading legacy of the Holocaust. And then very important, the internet and social media. And uh, I'm sure we'll talk more about social media, so I'll stop here. Um, but I think that in general, this is what... Um, this is the landscape of what we're seeing right now. You're, yeah, you're muted. <laughs> well, um, when you said we're going to get to social media sooner or later, it's going to be sooner than later. So, Let's do so it. <laughs> um, uh, you know, I think that that Aaron helped to identify exactly what what the problem was. I mean, ten years ago, I would bring a Holocaust survivor to a a room and if it was a good room it had a hundred people in it and those hundred people would be convinced and hopefully would not be swayed by holocaust denial in an age of social media i don't know that getting people together a hundred at a time makes sense when there's not only you know misinformation out on social media but then it's followed by a hundred comments uh, that underscore the misinformation which is in the social media. How do you combat it? Yeah. So, I mean, the definitely the cyberspace is a very complicated one and a very pernicious one for the Jewish community and other communities as well. Um, I'll say that, you know, at AJC, we work very closely with um, social media companies. We work very closely with Meta and with TikTok. Uh, they're aware of the issues and they're aware of foreign influence and bots um, that are happening. The main problem, I think, is really the scalability of the issue, because as you said, there are there's such a proliferation. There are so many bots that, and so many attempts really to destabilize our democracy and spew conspiracy theories and misinformation. And that's where it's really hard because considering the, you know, the, the millions of posts that you see that every second, stopping 95% of them is not enough. Like there are still too many out there. Now, the other part of what you're mentioning is also actually the 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 impact of AI. And that's something that we're just in the beginning of, you know, thinking about generative AI and how that also impacts some of the discourses, because we don't right now, these platforms are having a lot of issues controlling their large language uh, models, what they call the, their LLMs, um, to find the proper language to determine what is anti-Jewish hatred and how the computer system even, or the, you know, their 
their formulas uh, could stop it. And so that's definitely a big, uh, a big problem. And I think that, um, but I think we have to remember one thing, which is that if we think about just a couple of years ago, even seven or eight years ago, there were hardly any um, laws or any uh, sort of uh, ways to stop what was happening, that there was, there was really not much out there. And there's been a huge amount of action taken by some of those media companies, not enough for sure. But, you know, if you look at 2015, even before 2013 or 14, ISIS had over 70,000 accounts on Twitter. Twitter banned um, ISIS, and it's actually made it much more difficult for ISIS to recruit and to reach new people. They've moved to other platforms, that's for sure. But still, it has an impact on the way that you know some of those terrorist organizations are actually dealing with information and misinformation of the of the public. Um, I'm going to stop here because I see that there, my colleagues there have uh, their hands up. <laughs> yeah. So uh, Alisa and then uh, Nadine and Tyler, we're going to get to you in a minute. Okay. I just was going to respond on the social media when you have a minute. So. Go for it. Great. So um, I think one of the additional points, you know, well, it's not only the speed now with which this, um, these conspiracies and anti-Semitic tropes can spread around the world in seconds, but as lawyers, if we're trying to think about who we hold accountable and how we hold them accountable and what we hold them accountable for, it's not as if these platforms are just sitting there passively and allowing this information to be posted. There are algorithms that are reinforcing and then sending the people who seem to express some kind of interest in this type of information. It's then flooding them with more and more and more and more of it. And that's something that, while well, yes, it will require, right, initially, the um, the ability to identify the words that uh, that signify the anti-Semitism. And one of the challenges that anti-Semitism, we can talk about this later, tends to punch up as opposed to punching down, right? So you're not talking about Jews as um, a, being lower, right? You're talking about Jews as having power, which is not something that the original um, systems that are looking for racist comments or others may be may be programmed. But once you've identified that, there's absolutely no reason in the world why those posts should continue to be pushed out pursuant to these algorithms. Shut those down. As soon as you've recognized that it's anti-Semitic, you may not need to take it off, right? There are people who will, we can talk about speech and and but you don't have to promote it and and push it out so that you're reinforcing that message because again we can talk about once you're living in that bubble and you're just getting the same messages i mean aaron talks about how quickly there were those who denied the reality of what happened on october 7th but once those people were looking for the sources that were supporting their denial of reality the algorithms were feeding them more and more and so we need to shut that, down those algorithms that are are pushing out the anti-Semitic hate. If I may, I just wanted to chime in on social media um, in response to everybody who has addressed it so far. There's a really important point that I think should not go without stating, which is not only is does social media make it easier to spread anti-Semitic disinformation and conspiracy theories, it makes it much easier to respond and to put out accurate information, including the wonderful initiatives that the various organizations all of you represent have been making available. So I think the opportunity uh, to educate about the Holocaust, Mark, we don't have to rely anymore on bringing 100 people into a room. We have the same opportunity to, re to go viral uh, as everybody else does. And I think what's so interesting is that um, those who oppose hatred and the anti-anti-Semites uh, have been 
aggressively and vigorously using the resources of the internet and social media from the beginning. I remember when uh, the internet first hit the public and political radar screen in the early 1990s, I was on a panel uh, that the Anti-Defamation League organized, and it was strongly opposing, as it still does, government censorship of the internet, which then had a lot of traction, uh, and was talking about the unparalleled opportunities if somebody is, for example, looking for anti-Holocaust uh, denial misinformation, you can track that and you can uh, steer them toward the Simon Wiesenthal Center, uh, for example. So I think uh, we should follow the adage of uh, and the wisdom of Louis Brandeis, the great first Jewish Supreme Court justice, who said that who opposed censoring even hateful speech. I, I know nobody's advocating that, uh, but that beyond not censoring it, he said the best answer to evil counsels is good ones. So let's harness social media for that purpose. Let's continue to do so. Yeah, and I'll just add, actually, if that's okay, that, um, that, that you know, some of the, the public pressure also that we can do is very successful. So, you know, in 2020, there was actually a campaign fighting specifically Holocaust denial and Holocaust distortion. And there, there were basically Holocaust survivors participating in this initiative, which was called No Denying It, where they were pressuring Mark Zuckerberg to, you know, to remove all of those posts denying the Holocaust. And it worked. They actually removed it from Facebook. So I think that you're exactly right. And we should um, really counter some of the negative with real education and real resources that um, that can uh, that can make uh, things change for sure. Uh, Mark, you're still muted. <laughs> That's what I get for trying to be polite to our panelists and not and not have uh, back. I'll 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 be ruder going forward. So um so um Ali, if you could have ready um the uh, the the video that's out there, uh, I do want to respond to one question that came through. It was pointed out the 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 ADL uh, ten the the ADL attitude summary was noted it had somewhat more than four thousand respondents, and the question was why so few. And the real question is why so many? Um, most public, most uh, pollsters will tell you that eleven in a scientifically selected survey, eleven hundred is the magic number. If you get to eleven hundred, uh, you get statistics which are accurate plus or minus three percent. And if you increase that number, no matter you can go to eleven thousand or one hundred eleven thousand, you're still going to have kind of a plus or minus that gets close to three percent. ADL, if you look at its at that, it says that it oversampled and it intentionally oversampled to make sure that it gets uh, it 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 got accurate data. So I really wanted to answer four thousand is not a small number; it's a pretty large one. So Ty, as you unmute yourself, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, I think that that we've got a lot of speakers who are dealing with this kind of with national um, platforms, et cetera. You've got a smaller regional footprint, but I don't think that anybody suggests that the San Francisco Bay Area is likely to be a particularly um, easy environment to get coalition partners working on this. So starting with the assumption that the Jewish community can't do this alone, and this is a broader issue than the Jewish community, what are you and the JCRC and the organizations that you're doing, how do you assist coalition partners? And I say this as the ABA is commencing its effort to try to combat anti-Semitism. How do you do it? What are the steps that you take? Well, thanks, Mark. And, and hi, everybody across the country. Um, I would say that we begin with a fundamental assumption about Jews. And I actually think that when we start with doing anti-Semitism education, we're actually skipping a critical step, which is who and what is a Jew? Because if you don't understand the full notion of what Jewish identity is and all of its complexity, you're not going to hear those dog whistles of anti-Semitism. And so we are not simply a religion. We are not simply a people, a culture, a nation. Uh, we don't simply have a Jewish state. We are all of the above. And every Jew has a different relationship with each of those forms of identity. And 
So what I, education about Jewish identity needs to be baked in anywhere people are learning about identity. And so whether that's our K to 12 education system, higher education, whether that's through DEI trainings, we have to start by making sure that this country understands what a Jew cast as a white, religious, privileged minority in this country, partially because the dominant and our identity has been compared to that in this country. But when we are dealing with city halls, other minority communities, K-12 schools, et cetera, if they don't understand who we are and what our needs are to feel seen, heard, and belong, there are going to be massive gaps that evolve as a result. And that's what we're seeing across the Bay Area. That's what we're seeing across the country. Um, but that, I believe, is where we need to start and reframe the discussion about why this problem is compounding, why Jewish identity and anti-Semitism are denied a place in DEI, denied a place in ethnic studies. It's because people don't get who Jews are. So I think that's where we need to begin the conversation, whether it's with an Asian leader in San Francisco Chinatown or whether it's a candidate running for Congress um, in Silicon Valley, whatever it is or wherever you're from. So that's really, I think, what we've been skipping a step of for a very long time. And now we are rapidly trying to figure out how to play catch up. Um, and so, you know, there's been a major push across the country to celebrate Jewish Heritage Month um, and to make sure that we are engaging diverse communities in local, state and federal government. Um, but we need to bring communities in. It's never good when our community turns inward. The success of every Jewish diaspora community in our 2000 years of history as a diaspora um, has been measured by the strength of our relationships with government and, and systems, as well as with other communities. And so our whole strategy is building relationships with other communities, bringing those elected officials early to Israel and to engage with first John and to make sure that they understand who we are and what our needs are. And so one prime example of what's working is, is our work with the Asian Pacific Islander community. Um, you know, I draw many parallels between what the Jewish community is experiencing right now to the surge of anti-Asian hate as a result of COVID and the scapegoating that Asian Americans have experienced, including violence against Asian seniors in San Francisco, Oakland, New York, Chinatowns, and across the country. We are experiencing collective punishment for events overseas that we may have an opinion on, we may not have an opinion on, we, we may have no connection to. And so we are facing the consequences of that. And so we feel this natural bond with the API community because of that, because of our concern for public safety and high quality public education and this model minority myth that has been thrown against us when we try to advocate for our needs. Um, and so we've built a Jewish API roundtable here in San Francisco, where we are looking out for each other. We're at each other, sugarcoat it and say everything's great. But where the API community has stood up for us in the Bay Area, where communities have been. my suggestion to everybody is to really find those common bonds with other communities and move on those. You don't have to agree on everything. We don't have to build consensus on everything, but there are clear and present opportunities with other communities where we can build bridges and where we can advocate on issues together. And Mark, I think you want to turn to the downside. I'm trying to bring everybody up, uplift everybody a little bit, but why don't we roll the tape? So that's always your style to try to uplift while I try to bring people down. So that's okay. Uh, uh, what I, I do want to say though, Ty, while we are showing this, uh, you're uh, you're um, glitching a little bit on the computer. So I don't know if I'll, I'll turn off my camera some other me. browsers or doing something like that might 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 help that. So um, uh, what um, what you're about to see is uh, a minute and a half of um, video from an Oakland City Council meeting uh, about three miles to my left um, as I'm sitting here in Berkeley. And um, uh, the the issue, I guess, was the following, that, that there was a resolution before the Oakland City Council um, condemning Israel. There was a motion to amend that resolution to add reference to Hamas 
in the resolution. Uh, that amendment, by the way, to, is going to fail, um, failed. What you're seeing right now are uh, public comment debates opposed to any criticism of Hamas. Roll the tape, please. There's not been beheadings of babies and rapings. Israel murdered their own people on October 7th. Calling Hamas a terrorist organization is ridiculous, racist, and plays into genocidal propaganda that is flooding our media and that we should be doing everything possible to combat. I support the right of Palestinians to resist occupation, including through Hamas, the armed wing of the unified Palestinian resistance. As an Arab, asking with this context to condemn Hamas is very anti-Arab racist. The notion that this was a massacre of Jews is a fabricated narrative. Many of those killed on October Thank 7th, you, ma'am. Your time is up. including children, were killed by the IDF. An amendment condemning Hamas is bald propaganda meant to... Thank you. Your time is up. To hear them complain about Hamas violence is like listening to a wife beater complain when his wife finally stands up and fights back. Question. Did anyone else notice that those who oppose this resolution are old white supremacists? There's been a lot of atrocity propaganda ranging from claims of beheaded babies to mass rape. Hamas is not a terrorist organization just because the U.S. and Israel um, deems it so. Hamas is a resistance organization that is fighting for the liberation of Palestinian people and their land. Thank you, Ali. Um, so, uh, Ty, um, uh, I've gotten notices about uh, meetings like this, Richmond City Council, San Francisco Teachers Union, um, you know, probably a half a dozen uh, alerts from your office. Uh, how do you combat this kind of stuff? And a question I'm going to lay out there for the entire panel uh, is, can somebody articulate why what we just heard is not protected or is it political speech and it is is that what we're hearing um why is it more ty you can start us off great and i'm, I'm going to turn off my video in hopes that that helps with the audio so look unfortunately this ideology is running rampant and we're not going to be able to stop all of these and so there's there's two concerns one is that there are these unfair resolutions some of which are overtly anti-semitic because they charge the jews with having too much power and replacing the word jews with zionists or israel and using that same trope is is modern anti-semitism um but even if they're not these resolutions which we disagree with on a policy level which is not what we're here to talk about are inviting this mass form of anti-Semitism in these in these halls. And I was sitting in that room for six hours and it was the most experience of my life. And and what video pales in comparison to some of the the comments that those of us in the room were there were were facing, you know, with whispers that weren't on the on the microphone. Um and so, you know, this demon is mass Last demon is it. And what we're really concerned about is these council members have a right to free speech also. You know, they have a right to call it out. They have a right to condemn it in the moment. And, you know, in some ways, when when your detractors are shooting themselves in the foot, get out of the way. I don't think that these people are helping their cause. They're showing themselves not to be, you know, productive or rational players. Um, but the fact that council members aren't using their own right to free speech to condemn this and call this out, they have that same right and they're not exercising it. So even if there are limitations on what we can do around hate speech, we need to equip legislators where these things are happening with the ability to call it out in the moment. Not doing so is giving this permission. It's causing it to spread like cancer. And one of the unique roles, as Mark mentioned about RJCRC is... You know, what what happens in the Bay Area doesn't always stop in the Bay Area um, and quite often spreads like wildfire. Usually the Bay Area and Boston are sort of the two places where far left anti-Semitism comes up with a great new idea and then spreads to the rest of the country. And we work closely with the Brandeis Center on some of the legal issues that that I'm sure will be co covered soon. Um, and so that is really our main concern with freedom of speech and where we have a lot, a lot of work to do. Nadine, I see your hand up. Um, 
I, I don't know. I, I raised my hand when you asked about the free speech issue, but uh, Tyler. This answered, is just this is just a bunch of people talking to a city council, isn't it? Why is Tyler this? answered it perfectly? A plus from this constitutional law professor, um, especially about the importance of uh, counter speech, as we lawyers often call it. A few years ago, I wrote a book called "Hate: Why We Should Resist It with Free Speech, Not Censorship." The key verb there is resist. And I think there is a moral obligation, uh, especially when you are opposing censorship, to raise your own voice affirmatively, proactively, vigorously to condemn the hateful views. I have three uh, epigrams to this book, uh, all of which are talking about the power of counter speech and conversely, the damage that is done and the reinforcement of hatred by the absence of counter speech. And since we just celebrated Martin Luther King Day a couple of days ago, let me just uh, quote one of the three, which is Martin Luther King, who famously said, in the end, we will remember the silence of our friends more than the speech of our enemies. So I really, we really have to keep putting the pressure on those so-called friends. They're not true friends if they're not speaking up. Um, and so, Ty, just one other thing before I leave, before I I I leave you uh, and move to our other, uh, our next panelist, and that is, it's also the case the executive director of a, of a wider bridge and and um, uh, uh, you know publicly affiliate with the LGBTQ community in the Bay Area. Um, you know, when I was involved with the JCRC, there was this accusation of pinkwashing of of trying to justify uh, 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 improper conduct by by a supposed uh, friendliness towards um, uh, uh, the LGBTQ community in Israel. Is that an issue that you face? Is that an issue that you've got solutions for? A lot of the comments that we're getting in the chat, by the way, are kind of enough already. We know there's a problem. What do we do about it? So that, there's like a lot of uh, a lot of comments basically say pretty much that so i'm i'm no longer uh i don't i don't have two jobs but i am still very much in, involved with the wider bridge that was my previous role um look, I, my been, apologies to ethan felson he'll kill me for that as well so i i, I that's okay maybe he wishes uh, he wasn't doing that right now cuz there's a lot of challenges <laughs> Um, but this idea of pinkwashing started in the corporate world where this idea that corporations were, um, you know, having rainbow stuff in the month of June to sell, you know, rainbow Bud Light cans and rainbow rainbow floats for corporations at, at pride marches. And actually they're doing it to, you know, polish their image. And so this charge became something about national issues when the detractors of Israel started saying that, oh, Israel's. LGBT community is really just um, a cover up for, you know, whatever their charge against Israel is, apartheid, genocide, all these ludicrous claims. Um, the reason this doesn't hold up is because the LGBT community in Israel fought for every right that it had against its government every single step of the way. And they petitioned the Supreme Court for each of those rights. And Israel was the first country to have out military service, out spousal benefits. In fact, the same year we passed Don't Ask, Don't Tell in this country was the year that gay and lesbian service members in the IDF could serve openly, 1993. So we went in the opposite direction in this country. And so it's deeply offensive to me, who has friends and activists in Tel Aviv and across the country who fought and protested their government for each of those rights. And because Israel's a democracy, to, to charge this country with pinkwashing is to censure and erase the LGBTQ community in Israel. And by the way, one place Tyler, in Palestine. Tyler, we heard you say, and by the way, and we really want to hear the end of that sentence. There you go. And one of the few places you can see Israeli, Palestinian, Arab, Muslim, Christians come together. And so, um, you know, this is a really special community that should not be maligned. And we think that Israel's LGBT community has a lot to offer. The global queer movement. What do we do about it? There's no secret sauce. It's relationship building. 
you need to get involved, whether it's through legal, whether it's through social, whether it's through local government, and start building relationships where you have influence. I think our community has been very effective on the federal level, but we have overlooked the importance of local and state and school board relationship building, advocacy, and organizing. And there is no substitute for having the relationships because in a world where everyone is entitled to their own facts, the more trusted source is gonna win out at the end of the day. So what I would leave everybody with is figure out where you can build relationships that count. And you also never know where they're gonna go. We brought Kamala Harris to Israel when she was San Francisco district attorney. Now she's vice president. And so don't underestimate the importance of building relationships with rising star actors at the local level that could have incredibly important dividends down the road. Yeah, it's 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 a program JCRC has been doing for a long time. I don't know if you have an absolute number type, type of uh, of how many public officials uh, in Northern California uh, JCRC has brought to Israel uh, on an educational tour. By the way, both in Israel proper and on the West Bank, it's a pretty, pretty... Um, a broad and strong program that doesn't shy away from showing all sides of it. And, um, uh, you know, it's, it, I don't know if it's 500 yet, yet but JCRC has been bringing, uh, uh, influentials to understand the facts for a long time. I just and, want to add, sorry. And, and JCRC is doing an amazing job there. I just want to also say that AJC is doing a similar, has a similar project program called Project Interchange, where we take elected officials, mayors, uh, actually even uh, university administrators and so on to Israel as well. And we show them the, we let them hear voices from Palestinians, Arab Israelis and uh, Israelis. So we're, we have a very similar uh, program. And I will say that it really has a major impact. As Stai mentioned, it really has a major impact to hear and to be on the ground and see what's actually happening because all of the misinformation and disinformation that we hear is is just you know it, it, it's dismantled once you are talking to people and seeing the reality so i think that talking to different taking different communities and bringing them to israel and having those difficult conversation is really important so let me turn to elisa if i could and um and uh, ask this, uh, and and there's actually before doing this one slide. I've got one last slide that I want to put up there, both to follow up on what Tyler said, and kind of in advance of what uh, 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 the question I'm going to ask Eliza. And and it's it's this um, when you talk about uh, Jewish identity in Israel, there was a study done by the Pew Research Center. I dare say maybe the most uh, well-respected uh, uh, polling and research institute in the United States. I don't know how much Gallup is doing these days. And what they say is that 45% of Jews say that caring about Israel is essential to what, be, what being Jewish means to them. And an additional 37, if you add the 45 and the 37, you get to 82, say that caring about Israel is important, even if it's not essential, important part of their Jewish identity. Um, so with that, um, Elisa, I know that that uh, 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 you're often described as you know basically one of the one of the uh, most important civil rights lawyers representing Jews on issues of, of discrimination um, on campuses under Title VI, um, uh, uh, in workplace under Title VII. Uh, we've got an audience of several hundred uh, lawyers. Um, on this call, and a lot of the questions that have been coming in are uh, everything that Dean says about free speech is great, except people are afraid of being harassed. They're afraid of being punished. They're afraid of of uh, being retaliated against. Uh, they're afraid to step up because of dangers to themselves. We've heard a lot of things about you know broad social issues and coalition building. Question is, what legal rights? defenses, remedies are there if people are being victimized by anti-Semitism. Thank you, Mark. So first of all, I want to thank you and Richard and the ABA for including me with this august group of, uh, of really leaders in this area. And I think the first um, the first piece that we have to recognize is that we're not talking anymore about just speech. 
right? We're actually talking about conduct. And I, as president of the Brandeis Center, I speak almost every single day to students on campus. And I can tell you, those students were already for years, and we go back prior to October 7th, right? The Brandeis Center was already busy because students have Jewish students on campus, particularly that 82% that you just talked about, who feel this connection to Israel, and we'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute, those students were already being disparaged, demonized, dehumanized, shunned, marginalized on campus before October 7th, right? They were already finding themselves pushed out and excluded from certain spaces on campus because they were being labeled Zionists and treated as pariahs. Today, post-October 7th, we're actually seeing students being spat upon, students being pushed, students being assaulted, right? This is now elevated. When you go back to your, um, what you started the program with, with the ADL uh, levels of hate, this may have started with biased attitudes, but we are already in the conduct phase. We're already seeing the marginalization of Jews, the shunning of Jews, the harassment and discrimination of Jews. So in order for us to effectively be able to use the law to address that anti-Semitic harassment and discrimination, the first thing we need to understand, as Ty said, and as Alexandra said, is we need to understand who Jews are. We need to really have a better understanding of Jewish identity. And one of the problems that we see on the campuses, and um, Aaron Kiak uh, referred to this when he talked about how there were those who always saw Jews as just a religion, right? And the idea of discrimination against Jews as just religious discrimination. In other words, universities have often thought, well, for the Jewish students, all we need to provide for them is to make sure that they can practice their faith with pride. And certainly my father and I, for years, my father way before me, it's just, I, I was raised um, to use the law to try and protect, uh, to make sure that members of the Jewish community could practice their faith freely in this country and that the laws in the United States would be applied to protect the practice of Judaism. But the issue today is that um, quite frankly on campus, and even beyond campus, the overwhelming majority of Jews who are experiencing this harassment and discrimination, they don't define their Jewish identity according to religious practice. And the reason is because the Jews, as Ty was saying before, and Alexander too, are much more than a religion. We are also a people. And the Jewish people, what makes us the Jewish people, is that we feel that we have this shared common history, this common ancestry, this common memory, right? We are descended from those who were once slaves in Egypt, who wandered for 40 years in the desert, who reached the promised land, right? And the, the life of the Jewish people was actually, um, as a people, was, was established in, in Israel, in our ancestral Jewish homeland. In fact, many people don't realize, but that according to Jewish tradition, there aren't just 10 commandments, there are actually 613 commandments in the Pentateuch. And over half of those commandments actually relate um, to the land of Israel, can only be fulfilled in the land of Israel because they deal with the, the whole life of the Jewish people as a people in that land. So it not only are things governing agriculture in Israel, but governing the court system, the Sanhedrin, which only applied in Israel, governing the kingship, the kings of Israel, governing the practice in the Jewish temple, which was the holiest site for Jews, around the world was the temple on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, um, the practices in the temple, all of these commandments solely relate to the Jewish people in the land. And throughout history, throughout centuries of exile and dispersion, the Jews not only has there always been a Jewish presence in this land, but for those who were scattered around the globe, they never lost hope. They never lost that yearning that someday the Jews would once again, right? There'd be an ingathering of the exiles. That's why the Jews at the end of the Passover Seder will say next year in Jerusalem, or at the end of the Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, next year in Jerusalem, because there is this, this sense of and part of Jewish identity that has recognized that the Jews ancestry, their heritage is inextricably intertwined with this land. And today you have Jews who may be very critical of the current policies of the government of Israel. They may be very anti Bibi Netanyahu, but they celebrate, right, this part of their ancestral heritage that links them to this land. They may also feel that 
because of the way history has played out. And as Alexandra said, right, it, the anti-Semitism ebbs and flows, but they've seen that what happens in history is that while Jews may be welcome at one point in a country, a century later, they may be exiled from that country. So there is this sense that for the safety and security and continuity of the Jewish people, the Jewish people must have a safe homeland somewhere, and it should be in our ancestral homeland. So for Jews who believe that the Jewish people, as the Jewish people, have a right to self-determination in some borders in our ancestral homeland, there may be disagreement about what those borders should be, but they believe that there should be um, a right to Jewish self-determination in some borders in their, the Jews' ancestral homeland, those individuals are now being labeled on campuses and beyond as Zionists. And for them, this Zionism, this connection to Israel is not a viewpoint. It's not an opinion. It's an essential, integral part of how they define their Jewish identity. And it's on the basis of that part of their Jewish identity and how they define their Jewish identity that they're not being told they're not welcome. So you have students on campus who are passionate about these issues, women's rights, LGBTQ rights, immigration issues, climate change. They desperately want to engage and be part of the advocacy groups on campus that are advocating on these issues. And yet they're being told, you know what? If you want to join us, the first thing you have to be ready to do is um, disavow this connection to Israel, right? Chant with us from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. Believe and accept and promote the idea that Israel has no right to exist in any borders. That is now becoming the litmus test for these students on campus. And that's the, the discrimination. That's the, the exclusion. That's the shunning. That is the anti-Semitic harassment and discrimination that Title VI requires the universities and actually, quite frankly, requires any entity that receives federal government funding to, um, to protect against. And that's the source of the, the legal basis and the, and the complaints that we have been bringing. So, in. so Elisa, let me um, uh, sharpen the point and have uh, and, and have anybody on this on, on this way in, because there's a lot of questions on this. And and I'm I'm thinking and hoping that this panel really has got some answers to it. Uh, I think by every definition, um, uh, uh, without more criticism of Israel is not per se anti-Semitism and shouldn't be viewed that way. So one of the things that you hear on the news is that uh, true or not, I'll just repeat this on the news, is that Bibi Netanyahu is prolonging the war because this is the way he stays in power. And he knows when the war is over, he's out of power, so he's prolonging the war. That's one. Um, and then you've got the video that we just saw, that the IDF uh, uh, committed a false flag operation on October 7th and committed all, all the, uh, the um, uh, uh, rapes and murders, um, or that Israel is an illegitimate colonialist state. So... Where do you, where does one draw the line? Is there an easy way to identify um, why, uh, uh, why it's the case that you can, uh, you can oppose uh, any statement Net Netanyahu makes? You know, it's, it seems like a different universe when judicial reform was kind of tearing up the American Jewish community. And there were, um, you know, a, a, uh, you know, folks who who you know uh, embrace Israel with both arms, who were attacking Israeli policy, um, and the kinds of stuff we just saw. Where do you draw the line, Elisa? Well, so I the I think the most important source that the audience can look at, and I would um, advise them is to actually to answer this question to go back to the 2010 State Department definition of anti-Semitism. Many people are not aware and. You know, Aaron Kiak mentioned the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance definition of anti-Semitism, which was issued and adopted in 2016. And I should say that is a definition that was adopted by over 31 countries, right? Uh, it was governmental representatives, not just scholars, but governments that unanimously agreed on the language of the IRA definition. But before the IRA definition, back in 2010, the Obama administration, it was the first time that the United States had ever formally adopted a definition of anti-Semitism. And if you go back, and I think it's in your 21 you know, points, if you go back to that 2010 definition, you will see, first of all, it makes clear at the 
you know, in, in italics, it says that criticism of Israel, similar to that leveled against any other country, cannot be regarded as anti-Semitic. So then the question is, well, what is, the amazing thing is that this definition, and what's important to realize is that this definition is identical to the IRA definition, and then it has a whole list of examples afterwards. But what is different from the IRA definition is that the examples are broken down, and I don't know if you can see it here, but the second page um, has a heading that actually says, what is anti-Semitism relative to Israel? This is the State Department definition, asks the very question you just asked. And if you go to that State Department definition and you see what is anti-Semitism relative to Israel, well, they break it down into three categories. They say when the criticism demonizes Israel, applies a double standard to Israel, or delegitimizes Israel. And the demonization, if you understand how anti-Semitism works, and that no matter what the century, no matter what the era, no matter what the conspiracy theory, right, it always blames the Jew. The Jew is to blame for whatever that society views as its misfortune or as its evil. And you can have conflicting theories because, you know, some people may think, right, that's how you had the people accuse the Jews of being the communists, while other accuse the Jews of being the capitalists. It doesn't matter. It's the conspiracy theory and the Jew is the scapegoat. The Jew is to blame. And what ends up happening then is the way anti-Semitism works is it pushes the Jew out of acceptable society. I mean, think about the yellow star of David that the Nazis had the Jews wear. The idea was those Jews, you don't deal with them. You don't interact with them. Right. So the idea is that anti-Semitism denies individual Jews their place in society. This newer form of anti-Semitism is seeking to do the exact same thing to the Jewish collective, because now, ever since the creation of the state of Israel, we don't just have individual Jews scattered around the world. We actually have a Jewish nation state, the Jewish state of Israel. And what you start to see is that now what happens is instead of just demonizing and dehumanizing individual Jews, saying that they're they're greedy, they're controlling, they're bloodthirsty, right? They're doing everything for their own benefit and not for others. You see those same, that's the demonized Israel, those same anti-Semitic tropes, but now being leveled against Israel as the Jewish collective. It's not a discussion about Israel's policies or any kind of trying to, uh, a constructive criticism, trying to reach some resolution of the Arab-Israeli conflict. Instead, what it's trying to do is demonize Israel as the collective Jew. Why? In order to push Israel, the nation state, out of accepted society. So if in, the truth is, Erwin Cutler, the former, he just recently stepped down as the special envoy uh, to counter anti-Semitism from Canada, but he put it beautifully because he said, if traditional anti-Semitism sought to deny individual Jews their place in society, this newer form of anti-Semitism seeks to do the same thing, but to the Jewish collective, to the Jewish nation state, and deny it its place in the society of nations. Only Israel, it's the only country in the world that's told it has no right to exist. So the demonize Israel is when you apply this, demon, you demonize Israel, it's the devil, it's evil, as a Jewish collective, double standard is what we see at the United Nations, holding Israel to a higher standard than any other country, and delegitimize Israel is defined as denying the Jewish people their right to self-determination by suggesting that Israel is either a racist endeavor or has no right to exist. And that's what we're seeing a lot of now today on the campuses. That is Hamas's ideology, is that Israel has no right to exist in any borders anywhere, right? And I will tell you, this is, and I'll just show you, this is a map that was circulated by Students for Justice in Palestine on campus at Tufts University. So, Elisa, you're blocking your microphone, so we see the map, uh, but we can't okay. hear you. Here's the, here is the map um, that was circulated by Students for Justice in Palestine. It is a map of what the borders of Israel. But if you notice, um, there is no Israel on this map. It's all labeled as Palestine, and it's not what some will refer to as the West Bank that's labeled as occupied territory. It's actually 1948 Israel that is labeled as occupied territory on this map. In other words, this is the map. This was a map that was circulated at Tufts in support of what was called the Deadly Exchange Campaign, which was a campaign launched um, that blames, believe it or not, police brutality in America on Israel and the Jews. And this was launched at, uh, at Tufts. They... Um, they had learned that a prior police officer had once gone on one of these trips to Israel. The person didn't even work at Tufts anymore, but they they had a uh, referendum campaign. Every single student at Tufts had to vote on this. They wanted to make sure the university would apologize 
because they had once had somebody who had gone on a trip to Israel. They wanted to promise they'd never hire anybody who'd ever gone on one of these missions, would never allow anybody to go on one of these trips to Israel again. And um, and the the 43 student organizations, the whole progressive community on campus endorsed this referendum. So in other words, if you wanted to be huh. engaged, as I said, in any of these issues, this was the litmus test that you had to accept on campus. This put Jews, pretty much almost all Jews, on the wrong side of the social racial justice divide. That's the problem that's happening today. These so I'm going to come back to Eliza in a second. I want um, uh, Nadine to be able to, um, to uh, I, I think, to answer the question I posed, well, where's the line between criticizing uh, uh, Israel and and uh, and anti-Semitism when, uh, uh, like in terms of particular examples. According to that, let me say, uh, one question came in, identified this, that that they accurately note the, the IDF has prepared, has a 43 minute video that shows the worst of the atrocities of October 7th, probably five or 10 minutes of which many of us have seen. Uh, the other half hour um, have been seen by very few people. Nobody leaves with the video. Um, uh, uh, it's not for public dissemination. The question that comes up is why? And I think it's a very, uh, uh, as, as the IDF has explained it, it's, it's basically, it's a brutal snuff film of, of Jews. And I think that they're wary about, um, who gets to have copies of it. Uh, could it change minds? Maybe, uh, 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 could it be misused and celebrated? Probably. And that's the that's the answer. There is such a thing. That's the reason it's held back Nadine. Uh, uh, can you think of a, how to how you would phrase when legitimate criticism of Israel crosses the line into anti-Semitic behavior? Uh, if, with all due respect, Mark, I think even a more important question is when does legitimate criticism uh, stop and anti-Semitism begin, which Elisa has answered brilliantly. Uh, but the legal question is when does permissible expression of anti-Semitism end and impermissible harassment, bullying, threats, incitement, intimidation, et cetera, start. Because that, you know, I really relate to the questioners that you referred to, Mark, who said, okay, we understand there's a problem. What can we do about it? We're all activists. And I would like to focus on the positive. And in a, if we are to have free speech, which I believe is essential, in order to combat anti-Semitism and hatred and any form of government power to suppress unpopular perspectives is going to uh, come down very hard on anti-anti-Semitism and pro-Zionist and pro-Israeli and pro-Jewish speech. So as a minority, we have the biggest stake in policing those limits. I was very uh, heartened to see that the uh, resolution, the ABA resolution, Solution ends with two paragraphs that say all of this action to combat anti-Semitism is going to be done consistently with not only the First Amendment of the United States Constitution, but also the counterpart provisions in the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. Uh, but I have really come to understand after October 7th far more deeply than I did before that if we are to preserve freedom of speech as a meaningful reality for everybody in this country in order to be able to express themselves, to advocate for themselves and their people, including Jews, including Israelis, including Zionists, uh, there are two essential steps. One is better known than, th than the other. The one that's better known is that government and universities should not punish constitutionally protected speech. But the other aspect is that governments and universities should punish speech that is not constitutionally protected or not protected under the rules of their universities. And from all of the evidence that I've seen, to be sure, I haven't seen it all, you know, but from the evidence I've seen, the complaints I've read, there has been a consistent failure on the part of universities and other government officials to not only punish speech that is not protected, 
but even not to investigate, let alone punish conduct, violent conduct that is singling out um, Jews and Israelis or perceived Jews and, and Israelis. And, you know, that might sound a little bit counterintuitive for a free speech advocate to be advocating punishment of expression, uh, but intimidating, bullying, harassing expression not only is not protected on its own, it violates the free speech rights of other people. It interferes with their freedom of movement, with their equal opportunity. And that is exactly the legal concept of hostile environment harassment uh, that Elisa and her organization and some others have been uh, pursuing through complaints that are have been brought against a number of universities, including my alma mater, Harvard. I read the complaint, it was 88 pages long, uh, paragraph after paragraph that documented not only that anti-Semitic ideas were being expressed, as the president of Harvard correctly said, as a technical matter of law, depending on the context, those statements might well be protected. However, in other contexts, including many that have been now documented and, and alleged at Harvard, those statements are not protected. Uh, so for the example, the uh, Title VI definition of unprotected hostile environment harassment, which extends to not only conduct, but also expressly to, to words, to expression. Uh, I'm gonna read the exact definition here. Uh, first of all, it need not be directed at a particular individual. Um, and it's um, uh, unwelcome conduct, including verbal conduct, based on the totality of circumstances is subjectively and objectively offensive and is so severe or pervasive that it limits or denies a person's ability to participate in or benefit from the education program or activity. Uh, and once that kind of uh, pervasive or severe harassment through anti-Semitic expression and or conduct is documented, the universities have a legal responsibility to take prompt and effective steps reasonably calculated to end the harassment. And again, the complaints that I've read against Harvard and too many other universities are uh, that they have not even begun to take any such steps and, and in addition to not protecting Jewish students uh, against illegal harassment and other forms of illegal expression and conduct, uh, to add insult to injury, many of these universities are aggressively protecting against other forms of discriminatory or hostile environment harassment, and worse yet, punishing constitutionally protected speech that is critical of other minorities, including so-called Islamophobia. Uh, so in addition to the other violations of legal rights, there's a violation of equal protection uh, with respect to, to Jews and Zionists. So many thanks oh. to Elisa, and you would know far better than I do, but I assume that uh, the services and expertise of lawyers who are watching this could be harnessed to assist with uh, investigations and complaints of this type. I'm sure that for all of the hard work you're doing, it's just a drop in the bucket compared to the opportunities to do more such work. Nadine yes. took the question out of my mouth. So, Elisa, uh, what if a student feels um, that he or she um, or they have been uh, harassed or intimidated and and uh, suffer discrimination because of being Jewish. W what do they do? What rights do they have? What do they do? So one of the things that I'm glad you asked that is because it's particularly after October 7th, all of the organizations in this space were being absolutely flooded with requests for support and assistance. The Brandeis Center together with the ADL and Hill International and Gibson Dunn have set up a helpline um, which you can access at legal-protection.org. I think maybe we'll put that in the, the chat. And, uh, and what happens is I've actually trained now over 150 lawyers 
Um, if there are lawyers who wish to volunteer, they can also send an email to call because we call this our campus anti-Semitism legal line, C-A-L-L. So call at legal-protection.org is where you can send an email if you want to volunteer. Um, but we've done is trained lawyers to do the initial intake. So when the uh, students who are experiencing the anti-Semitism reach out to us, then they're paired up. We uh, provide that initial form with a very brief summary to one of the lawyers who then goes and does the uh, initial intake and then there's a group of attorneys from the Brandeis and the ADL and uh, Gibson and Hillel that are reviewing those to then determine the next step and make sure that the students get the kind of legal support that they need. I do want to say, and following on what Nadine was saying, is one of the key things is we have to push the universities to enforce some of the policies that they already have, but they are just not enforcing or they're not enforcing them equitably, right? It, it, for example, these extremely disruptive demonstrations, all of our attorneys, right, know in constitutional law, the first thing you learn is about time, place, and manner restrictions. The universities have an obligation, right, to be able to teach. That's why our students are there. And they, and they have these rules in order to prevent the disruption of the classes so that students can still learn. And yet we are hearing about uh, demonstrations that are so loud that students can't even hear the professors. They're blocking the entrances to academic buildings and universities are allowing this to happen. Not only are they allowing this to happen, we've had situations where there were universities where they decided, okay, they'll announce that they do have a rule and that you're not allowed to be in this location past a certain hour. And then what happened is they wanted to arrest the students. They told them they would be arrested. Students stayed in violation. And then the university realized that many of the students that would um, that were arrested or that would be punished were international students. They were visa holders. And that part of the condition of their visas is that they remain full-time students. So they could not suspend them from their academics. And so what was happening is you were ending up with American citizens being suspended from academics, but the visa holders were only suspended from extracurricular activities because the universities didn't want to threaten their visa status. That is unlawful. That's discriminatory, right? You cannot have universities choosing to apply their rules in an unequitable fashion. Um, there are many, right, many, many policies that the universities are just looking the other way and not enforcing to the detriment of the Jewish students who are experiencing the harassment and discrimination. One final thing that I will say is that we did with one of the um, cases that we brought against the University of Vermont, which is to date the one Department of Education, Biden administration, Department of Education resolution agreement dealing with anti-Semitism. It's the only university anti-Semitism resolution agreement that this administration has issued. Um, and they recognized because the anti-Semitism that was at issue at University of Vermont was overwhelmingly what we would call this anti-Zionist form of harassment and discrimination. So for example, you had a sexual assault support survivor support group, the largest support group on campus that had announced that they were blocking Zionists. And when Jewish students reached out to try and engage and have a conversation, they said, we don't talk to Zionists. There was a book club, the Revolutionary Socialist Union Book Club, that said to be a member of the book club, you had to pledge no to racism and to Islamophobia, and you had to pledge no to anti-Semitism, but also to Zionism to be a member. And then there was a teaching assistant who was constantly bullying um, uh, Zionists online. She talked even about and posted about this uh, serotonin rush she would get from uh, bullying Zionists in the public sphere. And she tweeted once about how she had tweeted the question, is it ethical for me, a TA, to deny Zionist participation credit? I think it would be good and funny. Minus five points for going on birthright in 2018, minus 10 points for posting a pic of yourself with a tank in the Golan Heights, or minus two points just because I hate your vibe in general. And I think we've included in the materials the resolution agreement uh, that the uh, Department of Education issued where they required the university to modify their anti-discrimination policies to make sure that they would address this kind of harassment and discrimination, which they treated as, and I quote, national origin harassment on the basis of shared ancestry. So going back to our whole earlier conversation about how you need to understand that Jews are more than just a religion, that they can be targeted on the basis of our shared ancestry and ethnicity, and that that is a form of harassment and discrimination that the laws in our country are designed to protect our students. Um, and, uh, 
And that's what we need. I want to thank you. That's also helpful. And uh, it really underscores something else that lawyers could contribute to, which would be really helpful, which is in addition to bad faith, failure to enforce a clear violations of policies, there is a tremendous amount of confusion and ignorance about where the line is between protected and unprotected speech. So a lot of people, including um, some staff members at universities who are uh, supposed to be enforcing free speech policies, don't understand that that disruptive protests are not protected. I can't tell you the number of reports I've received of people saying, oh, we can't shut down protesters because they're exercising their free speech rights, or we can't stop people from tearing down posters of the hostages because that's they're expressing their free speech rights. So there's a lot of ignorance that lawyers could be very, very helpful in uh, in dispelling. And uh, just kind of to follow up on 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 this uh, and and um, I very much appreciate the points that were made about uh, these rules needing to be uh, uniformly enforced and you can't enforce um, rights against one protected population and ignore uh, against others. So, in that light, let me let me ask this. I'm sure we agree there there is such a thing as Islamophobia out there, and there 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 are instances that occur on and off campuses. Uh, is from from the perspective of Jewish advocacy, is there is there any place where Jewish advocacy needs to cross over into Islamophobia, and are there common areas uh, are there any common areas to fight against both absolutely when when muslim students are harassed or discriminated against on the basis of their identity that also they need to be protected from that as well the challenge one of the challenges that we're seeing right now um, is that jewish ancestral identity is being denied and erased systematically and um, and so as the law is uh, there's as there's grow a growing recognition that the law protects Jews that Jews are more than a religion there are those that are insisting no the Jews are just a religion and when Jews are saying I define my Jewish identity as including Zionism there are those that say oh no you can't do that Zionism is not a part of Jewish identity right the Jews don't have an ancestral history and connection to the land of Israel. That is actually in and of itself, there's now a term that's been coined, they call that erasive anti-Semitism. And what we've seen happening are there are those who will deny and erase Jewish identity, what is the, the individual Jews, how they are defining their own identity, deny them that right, and insist that instead the Jews have to accept this loathsome identity that they're being told is what their real identity is. So in other words, they're being told that ancestral heritage that you claim you have, that's a lie, but we're going to tell you who you really are. You really are a white colonialist oppressor and you're, and you know, you are responsible for all the evils in the world today, racism, apartheid, colonialism, ethnic cleansing, genocide, that's who you are. And that's what's happening to Jews today. And that's, uh, that's what we have to push back against. Jews need to be recognized and respected um, and be able to come to the table with their full identity, just like we want every group to be able to come to the table with their full identity. That's the goal on campus, is that every group should be able to come and engage fully with their full identity at the tables. Um, that's that's the goal. The, the point is the university should be a place for robust debate about the issues, but don't disparage or marginalize or shun individuals on the basis of their identity. Mr. Gregory. I just want to make a point to what you asked, which is, you know, often we see the Muslim and Jewish communities paired together in statements or anti-Semitism and Islamophobia always paired together. Um, sometimes that is helpful and other times that is counterproductive. And, you know, too often we don't get that standalone statement. And I know that the Muslim community is frustrated by that too. But by pairing those two things together to cover your behind, I guess, because there's been problems on campus, um, it just reinforces the stigma that there must be something naturally wrong between our two communities. And that's not always the case. It's not the case in every context. It's not even the case always in the context of the October 7th post-debate that's been happening on campuses. And um, they are reinforcing 
and inflaming tensions when each of their statements always talks about anti-Semitism, Islamophobia paired together to cover themselves. And so I don't have a problem if an administration sends out something that only talks about Islamophobia, but we deserve that too, because it does look different as everyone's laid out today. And we deserve to have our own conversation. And so does the Muslim community. Um, but it's deeply problematic when I constantly see that because it, 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 I think it only invites more problems between our communities and reinforces to everybody else that something must inherently be wrong. Um, and so we we advise people. A little well, at, at the same is, time, uh, Ty, after the really um, horrific incident of uh, a six-year-old child um, uh, being killed in Chicago soon after October 7th, um, San Francisco JCRC was really quick to put out a statement condemning, uh, uh, you know, that act of Islamophobia, if I'm not mistaken, the other national Jewish organizations did too. So, um, I'm, I'm in, uh, I do understand the point about not having to couple it, not being, not being afraid to mention the word anti-Semitism without saying, and other forms of discrimination as well, of course. Um, but, uh, that's not to say that that for as kind of as long as I can remember, uh, as as opponents of hate on all sides, Islamophobia has been has been a target of the Jewish community as well. So, uh, hoping that's fair. <laughs> um, let me ask let me ask this about a couple about a couple of uh, you know other questions that that have come up. One has been on the topic of DEI. Um, there are there are many of us who are trying to promote, um, you know, the importance of of uh, of DEI for the Jewish community. After after our resolution passed last year, in fact, uh, the ADL sent us a letter: make sure that DEI that that part of what you do is extend DEI uh, to the Jewish community. I I I always promote the Harvard. Um, uh, for your alma mater, Nadine, uh, implicit attitudes test. If you go on to Harvard IAT, you will see an implicit bias test that that for a long time did not have uh, Judaism as part of it. And now it does. I urge anybody who's out there to take the IAT about Judaism and urge especially your non-Jewish friends to take the IAT test uh, about anti-Semitism. And what you'll find is like any other kind of implicit bias um, everybody is to us. Uh, I don't say everybody. There are saints out there, but almost everybody has got has got a bias against the other. Um, skinny people against fat, short people against tall, and um, Jews and non-Jews share that as well. And the reason that I say that is because uh, people in America, I think, have a tendency to say, you know, I'm not an anti-Semitic bone in 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 my body, not in our society. That's the thing about implicit bias. You don't recognize that it's there. With that long intro, a lot of the comments that we are getting um, in the chat room is, what's all this about DEI? DEI is a failed concept, a horrible concept, whatever people bring baggage into DEI. We should not be talking about discrimination, implicit bias against Jews being addressed in DEI courses, we should be talking about getting rid of DEI courses. Any responses that people have to that? Uh, I'm happy to go first. Look, I mean, before I get into the moral argument, I just want to say in my part of the country, that's an absolute non-starter. I mean, we would, you think we don't have enough allies right now? If we come out against DEI, we got none, okay? And so maybe you can do that in Texas. Maybe you can do that in the South. That's not going to fly here. The next point I would make is, I really think that it's problematic for us to speak on behalf of brown and black communities that have been advocating for this to say that it shouldn't exist anymore. And there's always been problems with the progressive movement when it comes to Jews in Israel, and we need to solve those problems. But we don't do that by dismantling things that our neighbors are advocating for. And so we need to have serious conversations with them because there are systemic failures within the system of DEI that are being weaponized against the Jewish community. And many of the people that are instigating problems on college campuses are in DEI departments. And so we need to tackle those real problems, but we don't do it by attacking our neighbors that are calling for this. And again, there are brown and black people that have problems with DEI also. They're not monolithic any more than our community is. 
but we need to be able to approach these spaces with empathy for why these programs were created in the first place, whether we agree with them or not, I just don't think it's the proper political strategy. Um, and so we demand a seat at the table. We're not asking for special treatment, we're asking for equal treatment. You know, in the same way we learn about you know, anti-racism, we learn about homophobia and transphobia, we need to learn about anti-Semitism as a system of oppression. And I believe that October 7th has not created anti-Semitism. I believe it was always there. And in the same way Charlottesville gave permission for the far right to unleash their anti-Semitism in a public way, October 7th has given that same permission to the anti-Semitism that's always been under the surface to pop out and run rampant. So let's not blame something for what was already there. Let's solve it. And I realize that's a more complicated answer. It's going to take a lot more work, but we'll find ourselves without a lot more allies if we take a sledgehammer to this thing. Thank you, Ty. Dr. Herzog. Yeah, I was going to say the same thing. I think that Ty exactly uh, addressed it. I think that, you know, DEI uh, structures and initiatives were really created to address the American racial binary. And that, unfortunately, right now does not fully account for the lived histories and the identities of the Jewish people. But the solution is not really to dismantle it, but rather to have more Jewish voices within DEI and express how anti-Semitism fits and how Jews fit within a DEI structure. So it's not so much the framework that needs to be dismantled, but rather like un like like talking to administrators and to people within the DEI framing and have them understand how Jews fit into this binary. I think that that's um, really important. Ms. Lewin. So I, I think that the idea of combating and countering and sensitizing our society to bias and discrimination is, is key. It's extraordinarily important. And that needs to be um, supported and promoted. It's the binary, though, that Alexandra is talking about that actually is what presents some of the problem within the DEI, some, not all, of the DEI programs, because it's when um, the world is divided in two, and there's a sense that there is a group of oppressors and a group that's the oppressed. What very frequently happens in the DEI programs that adopt that binary is Jews are not included. And I'm, you know, this is not, I, they're, they're viewed, right? The identity, the way Jews are portrayed are as all Jews are white colonialist oppressors. That's the identity that is put on Jews. And what happens when you put that identity on all Jews, right, is that these these programs that are ostensibly supposed to be um, helping sensitize people and teach them to recognize bias and discrimination, they're actually fostering bias and discrimination because they are actually perpetuating the uh, anti-Semitic stereotypes of Jewish control and Jewish power and Jewish, right, that the, the, that's, that's the problem. And so for the DEI programs that adopt that perspective, Unless you get rid of that binary and you stop including Jews in the and, and promoting this concept of Jews as white colonial suppressors, you're not you're not solving the problem. You're creating the problem. So yes, we must use everything and all the tools in our toolbox to counter bias and discrimination. But we have to stop this binary that um, that demands that Jews accept an identity, a loathsome identity that is not that doesn't be bear. Um, resemblance to reality. That's not our identity. We need a program that actually does talk about who Jews are and what our Jewish identity is, so that people can recognize harassment and discrimination of Jews. Not so that we should be considering ourselves victims. That's the other thing. Jews have not survived for centuries by adopting a victim mentality. They have actually been proud, resilient. Um, we, we are. We are small, but proud and resilient and determined people. And we need folks to understand our history um, to understand how we have managed to persevere through the difficult times in our history. You know, I, I, I'm going to try to rapid fire a couple of the questions. I know that we're just uh, past the hour, um, and, and I'd like to give the panelists the chance to, to um, kind of sum up for a minute. Uh, Nadine, a question that was put in for you. You know, you mentioned uh, fighting bad speech with good speech, to, to use the, uh, the short term for it. Um, how do you do the there there have been uh, reports that says you know TikTok gets billions of views on on uh 
it's misinformation, and we just do not have the platform to be able to to fight them um, one by one. We just we just don't have it. And so, um, what's a successful strategy? Uh, uh, you know, I hear you. The, the audience member hears what you're saying, doesn't think it can be effective. Well, experts who are working on this do think that it can be effective, including not only Jewish organizations and other organizations that are fighting against hatred of various sorts, including the Southern Poverty Law Center. But actually, I just saw that I got my one of my regular emails from uh, an online site called Life After Hate. Um, uh, online resources have been used not only to provide mass information, uh, but also very generous people have engaged one-on-one -on -one in dialogues with even leaders of hateful organizations who have redeemed them away from their viewpoints. And many of them have now formed organizations that are dedicated to preventing other people from going down that 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 rabbit hole. Uh, Life After Hate is based in Chicago. It's just one example. Uh, consists of people who were formerly leaders of anti-Semitic white supremacist organizations who were through online resources uh, redeemed from their perspectives and are de dedicating the rest of their lives to trying to undo the harm that has been done to them. And, you know, one of the advantages of online media is that you can actually be much more granular and scientific and empirical in checking what strategies work. You can have messages that are fine-tuned toward certain audience members or towards certain demographics. So um, everything that they can do, we can and should do better. And I'm sorry, I'm going to have, with apologies, I have another commitment. So I'm going to- So let me say this, let me start with you on- Extraordinary yeah, co-panelists and 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 Mark and, and, and say farewell. Nadine, I don't know if you have an extra 30 seconds, just I'll start with you. Is there any closing words you want to leave us before I turn to the other two panelists and ask the same question? Uh, other than thank you, thank you. And lawyers really can contribute a lot because knowledge about what is not permitted under the First Amendment and legal obligations that universities and other federal fund rate receiving institutions have uh, to inform them of their legal responsibility can really make a big difference. Uh, beyond that so-called counter speech, I know a lot of people think, oh, it's it's just words. Well, you know, hate speech and anti-Semitic speech, if it doesn't cross the line to harassment, is also just words. So you can't have it two ways. Either they're not powerful, in which case we shouldn't worry about hate speech, or they are powerful, and we should really take seriously the great deal of good that the positive information and the anti-hate rhetoric can do. Thank you, Nadine. Uh, we're going to go in reverse order. I'm going to go Lisa, um, Alexander, and Richard, if he wants to say something and sign us off. So just to follow on uh, what Nadine was saying, I think we also need to urge the universities to speak up. You know, the universities uh, seem to think that whenever any community on campus other than the Jews is targeted, that standing up and expressing support for that community is a form of um, standing up for human and civil rights. But for some reason, when it's the Jews that are being targeted, they say, well, we can't say anything because if we say something, it'll be viewed as a political statement. And that's part of our problem is that we need the universities to actually, we don't, we don't want them to make political statements, quite frankly. We don't want them weighing in on the Arab-Israeli conflict. What we want universities to do is to recognize that there's a community on campus that's actually riling up part of the, of the campus to turn against the Jews and to marginalize and shun the Jews. And the universities need to call that out and educate their campus community to see that that's happening and to say that's unacceptable. Now, I will say just in terms of words of closing, I have tremendous hope because first of all, the students that I talk to on campus are extraordinary. They are having the courage and the confidence to stand up and to speak out and to push back. And the lawyers, I will say, are also now standing up to provide those students who are then finding themselves 
targeted with disciplinary proceedings or harassment and discrimination, they're standing up to provide those students with the legal defense and the legal protection that they need. And the truth is hearings like what we had uh, the other month with the presidents of the universities uh, testifying on Capitol Hill, uh, that actually in a very strange way was a good moment because it opened the eyes of many people to the real problems that exist on campus, and you cannot begin to solve a problem unless you recognize that there is a problem. And there is a much, much greater recognition today um, that there is a serious problem out there on the campuses and beyond. And so that's the beginning of addressing it. So the combination of the students, the lawyers, using the law, which I think is a, a very, very powerful tool to address this, I think that we will um, at the end um, see change, see positive change. So I'm hopeful. Thank you so much, Alexandra. I'll be really brief because I also unfortunately have to jump, but um, I'll just say that, you know, thank you all for attending. Thank you for having me. I think that everything that's been said is so important and we really have to remember that, again, anti-Semitism requires everybody in society to act. The onus is not on the Jews to fight anti-Semitism. The onus is really on everybody else. And I think that there is also a notion of working with other communities and trying to understand each other a bit better. That's really important. Allyship, I think creating connection is really important. But at a time when we have such difficult conversations between groups, we really need to stop simplifying things and and putting everything in binary systems. As we've said today, and Eliza said it many times as well, this oversimplification and misunderstanding of who Jews are and Jewish identity and the diversity of the Jewish people actually has really tangible consequences. The same way, by the way, that you know, we have to also um, continue working on online platforms and social media and so on, but we don't actually, we're not facing even the same problem Problems that we were facing not so long ago, because back in the days, you know, people wanted to know the correlation between what was happening online or what was being said online and the actions against Jews in person. Unfortunately, we have so many proofs of that and the direct connection that we don't have to do that anymore. But I think that we have so many different types of work to do in so many different industries across uh, you know, society. And we have to understand that anti-Semitism, um, there's the fight against anti-Semitism, but there's also a lot of those people who are pushing for conspiracy theories are also threatening our democratic systems. And so again, it really uh, requires all of us to work together. Thank you. Richard, you're, you're muted. Yeah. Okay. So, so first of all, I just want to thank our panelists, our uh, although he's not here, our keynote speaker. This has been an incredibly rich and valuable conversation, uh, which I hope is going to educate a lot of people who have not thought uh, that deeply about what it means to exclude Jews from the from the public sphere because they support the state of Israel. We understand we get a lot of support when Jews are targeted uh, with swastikas or with or from the right. <laughs> Uh, but when the when the uh, attack comes from those who are uh, hostile to the concept of Zionism, and then they turn that into a basis to discriminate against Jews, whatever they think about Israel, whatever they think about Zionism, although I think uh, that it's it's quite clear that anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism are are certainly our fellow travelers, even if they're not identical with one another. But whatever they think about those things, it's untenable for Jews to be told that we can exclude you, we can discriminate against you because you, as an essential aspect of your identity, this really picks up what Elisa has been saying and others, yeah, as this the identification with Israel is an essential aspect of Jewish identity. If you exclude Jews on that basis, that they, they believe in the existence of a state of Israel, you are in fact saying we are entitled to discriminate against something like 80% of the Jewish population. That would not be tolerated in the context of any other minority group. It should not be tolerated in the context of Jews. And I hope that that this conversation, this is, is the opening of, of, a, of a clarification of that uh, in, in the larger community. Thank you. So uh, uh, before just closing us up, I, I, I want to thank um, uh, our, our panel. Thank you so much, as well as Ty and Nadine. The, this program, we're going to try to add many of the links to the things 
that have been discussed and and have this program be available. Um, there's so many questions that we didn't get to, and I apologize for that. I, I noticed our panelists have been answering some of them, um, some of them privately. Uh, one question, um, if, if anybody here could answer it, uh, you're entitled to the Nobel Peace Prize, and that would be um, you know, there's so many. We we have we've had four organizations on this call. There are many others that were not on this call. Uh, if you see this little blue pin over there, this is Stop Anti-Semitism, Robert Kraft's um, effort to publicize the fact uh, to our non-Jewish neighbors that we're 2.4% of, of the population and, and more than 60% of the hate crimes. There's so many. And the question that came through is, why can't all of these organizations, and I'll throw the ABA, which is now committed to join as well, um, why can't they work together better? Um, it's a question some of us have been thinking about for the past uh, uh, many decades. And any if if any of you've got the answer, write it down. We'll send it out to anybody. But I don't think that we have. So there are many questions we didn't get to. We will try to answer some of them. We I, I do want to ask all of the attendees uh, to join with us in the fight against um, anti-Semitism, to spread the word, to... Um, share this data, uh, not only with, with folks in the Jewish community, but maybe even more importantly, outside of the Jewish community, this is, in, this is you know, 2.4% of the population cannot do this alone. So so I think that that's, you know, really a, a critical step. Um, and so um, uh, with that, uh, thanking everybody for their, for their work, panelists and attendees, uh, let me note that the section of civil rights and social justice provides these free webinars and resources uh, to professionals and advocates nationwide in order to promote civil rights and social justice. We hope that this helps you with uh, your work. We hope this makes you interested in the section on civil rights and social justice, um, as this is so key a part of our agenda. And we look forward to working with you to actively combat this scourge of anti-Semitism. Uh, we're not gonna eliminate it. It's been there too long and it, it's, it it's, uh, takes a lot of gall to think that we're eliminating anti-Semitism. We have to fight against it every single day. And I think that that's the effort I, I hope everybody joins with. Thank you uh, for uh, the hundreds of you who stuck around in overtime and the another hundred or so who started our program with us. And thanks to our panelists